I want to welcome everyone this morning. Um, your clock is obviously wrong because we're starting right on time. No, not really. We, we had a little uh, technical difficulty and we are so glad you can be with us this morning. If you don't hear us or there's any technical difficulty on your end, please let us know. And let us know that you're listening by typing in hallelujah here, presence, whatever floats your boat. We're going to go back here to um, slide 200. And one of the technical problems we're having this morning is that our slides will not change without somebody sitting at the computer. So that's what we're doing. We've been talking about the, uh, we're in 2 Corinthians, for those of you who haven't joined us before, 2 Corinthians, we've gotten through chapters 1 and 2. Um, we are in chapter 4. We've discussed chapter 3. We'll reference that some this morning. And we are talking about Christ in us. Wow, what an exciting topic. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm sorry, chapter 4 says, um, we have this treasure from God. We're like clay jars that hold the treasure that shows the great power is from God and not from us. And of course, that links back to 2 Corinthians 2.16, where Paul says, who is able to do this work? And this is about where we left off. We did read into um, the tail end there the first part of chapter 4. I'm going to go to 201. Where it says, It's written in the scriptures, I believe, so I spoke. My faith is like this. We believe and so we speak. God raised the Lord Jesus from the dead and we know that God will also raise us with Jesus. God will bring us together with you and we will stand before him. At the end of chapter 3, we were discussing about reflecting God's glory as Christ reflected God's glory when he was here because he said, My Father is in me. I do only what my Father tells me to do. My Father and I are one. John says, That was God that came down here and was in the form that we recognize as a human. Let's start our discussion with new material here in chapter 4 with verse 10. 2 Corinthians 4.10 We carry the death of Christ in our own bodies so that the life of Christ can also be seen in our bodies. We are alive, but for Jesus we are always in danger of death so that the life of Jesus can be seen in our bodies that die. So, Death is working in us, but life is working in you. On its face and by itself, these verses you'd say, what in the world is, well, what a confusing set of verses. But if we link these to Paul's writings in Romans and, and other places, it makes sense what Paul is saying. In Romans 6, he says, did you forget that all of us became part of Christ when we were baptized? We shared his death in our baptism. When we were baptized, we were buried. So baptism is, is kind of a shadow. It's, it's, it's a metaphor for what happens to us spiritually. We are buried with Christ. We share his death. Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the wonderful power of the Father, we also can live a new life. I highlighted these two phrases here, the, the last part of 3, verse 3, the last part of verse 4, because we are going to reference back to those in regard to Paul's statement there in 2 Corinthians 4. Christ died and we've been joined with him by dying too, so we will also be joined with him by rising from the dead as he did. We know that our old life died.
died with Christ on the cross so that our sinful selves would have no power over us and we would not be slaves to sin. Slide. Anyone who has died is made free from sin's control. Obviously, if you're dead, this life, the things that tempt us here, they don't touch us. And we know we will also live with him. Christ was raised from the dead, and we know that we, he cannot die again. Death has no power over him now. Yes, when Christ died, he died to defeat the power of sin one time, enough for all time. He now has a new life, and his new life is with God. In the same way, you should see yourselves as being dead to the power of sin and alive with God through Christ. In 2 Corinthians 4, 10 through 12 that we read, Paul is proclaiming that he was buried with Christ, so he has experienced that death, and the life that he is now exhibiting, the glory of Christ living in him, is the evidence that that death took place in his body. This could mean uh, that his reflection of Christ in his life is evidence that he's died to himself. So his old man's death, the old body, the old person that he was, is proclaimed by the life of Christ that he lives. But more likely, and if you read the different commentaries and read other translations, more likely this refers to the fact that his physical body, where he says, um, carries the death in his body. His physical body is threatened by death. In verse 11, always in danger of death, because of his efforts to reflect Christ in his life and spread the good news. Verse 12. Our death is working in his life and working in you, because he was giving them the good news. <clears throat> so while his physical body is being threatened by death and gradually being destroyed by the different efforts that are directed against him by those Jews and Gentiles who were against the gospel and thought that this new movement was a terrible thing and was against God, he's gradually being destroyed by the different efforts directed against him. They're taking their toll on his physical body. Galatians 6, he talks about that he bears the scars, or he bears the marks. Some, some translations say scars, some say marks, that he belongs to Christ because of the message that he has delivered to great cost to these Corinthians as outlined in 2 Corinthians 6, 5, and 2 Corinthians 11, 23 to 28. He says, because of that great cost and the toll it's taking on me, life is working in you. He has delivered the life of Christ, and now they are alive in Christ. In light of these verses mentioned, Paul reflects both the death of Christ in his life and the life of Christ by his dying to self. Does that make sense? That's, that's 10 through 12. And again, if you have any comments or questions, type them in. We are watching for comments and questions. Because we previously discussed verses 13 through 15 in chapter 4, we are able to move then to verse 16, jump over 13 uh, through 15, because this ties in perfectly with the verses 10 through 12, which we just discussed. He says, life is living. Christ, the life of Christ is in me. The death of Christ is in me. So we do not give up, 2 Corinthians 4. Our physical body is becoming older and weaker, but our spirit inside us is made new every day. We have small troubles for a while now, 
but they are helping us gain an eternal glory that is much greater than the troubles. We set our eyes not on what we see, but on what we cannot see. What we see will last only a short time, but what we cannot see will last forever. With Paul, it seems life is all about perspective. And his focus is on Christ. And the life that is in Christ, with that as his focus, he is willing, he is able to undergo any hardship, any suffering, any ridicule, any resistance to reflect his master. Because he has seen his own. I'm not talking about when he talks about this individual, whether he was in the body or out of the body, went up to the seventh heaven. I'm not talking about that. Paul has seen his home by the eyes of faith. He says, we set our eyes not on what we see, but on what we cannot see. What we see will last only a short time, but what we cannot see will last forever. The sufferings we have now are nothing, he says in Romans 8, 18. Nothing compared to the great glory that will be shown to us. Everything God has made. He paints this picture of this, like a pregnant woman, this expected everything's... Ah, ah, ah. Everything God made is waiting with excitement. For God to show his children's glory completely. We want to see this baby be born. We know that everything God has made has been waiting until now in pain like a woman ready to give birth. Not only the world, but we also have been waiting with pain inside us. That's both a metaphorical statement and in Paul's case, a physical statement. We have the Spirit as the first part of God's promise, so we are waiting for God to finish making us His own children, which means our bodies will be made free. We will be saved, and we have this hope. If we see what we are waiting for, that is not really hope. People do not hope for something they already have, but we are hoping for something we do not yet, do not have yet. And we are waiting for it patiently. Paul's example encourages us to have spirit eyes. Where am I focusing my eyes? Have you ever been away from home? We, we, because of this virus thing, We've read in the news accounts of people who have been stranded in foreign countries, people who have been stranded on cruise ships. Have you ever been away from home and gotten sick or gotten injured, broke a limb or something? But most of us ever can relate to this, have gotten sick. You're just miserable. You're hugging the toilet. You're throwing up. You're running back and forth to the bathroom. You're just trying to find a position of comfort. You're so nauseated. You're so miserable. You cannot relax. You cannot rest. You're worn out. But you just cannot get comfortable. Where do you want to be? In some foreign bed? In some unfamiliar place? In some foreign land? where maybe some of the folks don't even speak your language? Not there. Our homeland, our place of comfort, our place we want to be when we're miserable is not a place we can go to at this time physically. As Paul states, if we already had it, we wouldn't be hoping for it. Have any of you ever driven into the, when the sun was setting or into a sunrise, 
the sun's out there low on the horizon, you're trying to drive, you're trying to see, and kind of do this number, you can kind of peek under your hand, but kind of block the sun out there, and you can see the low, not as well as you might be able to, but, and if you get it too close, obviously you can't see anything, but your hand, well, Satan wants to hold the world right there, and all that it has to offer right in front of our eyes, so that it blocks out the S-O-N, just as I might hold my hand up here and block, try to block out the S-U-N. In essence, Christ, but just look at what you already have. Look at everything around you. Don't trust in something you cannot see. That's a man. Are you, are you hallucinating? Live in the moment. This is as good as it gets. Enjoy it. Eat, drink, and be merry. Paul says, you've got to have Abraham's eyes. You've got to have Noah's eyes. You've got to have Enoch's eyes. You've got to have David's eyes. Eyes that looked beyond the day-to-day, -day, beyond the physical that surrounded them. Eyes that saw beyond the possible and believe that even though something is physically impossible, with God's power working in us, God can do much, much more than anything we can ask or imagine. Here's what Paul was able to see. And once for all believers, he we mentioned this last week when we talked about Ephesians. He also talks about this for the Colossians. In Ephesians, he says, I pray also that you will have greater understanding in your heart so you will know the hope to which he has called us. Understanding so that you'll know this hope and that you will know how rich and glorious are the blessings God has promised his holy people. And you will know, you will know as surely as you know that you're standing or you're sitting, as surely as you know that you got out of bed this morning, that you were in bed last, as surely as you know that God's power is very great for us who believe. The same power that he used to raise Christ and put him at his right side. There is nothing. You know, uh, Scripture talks about the works of the flesh, and, and those, those affect everyone at some point in their lives some of those less have less draw and appeal as we age but there is nothing like debilitating pain or misery to focus one on the here and now if you're in great pain you don't care about the next meal a gourmet chef could be cooking a meal and set it in front of you, you would not care. You don't care about the next vacation. You don't even care about the next hour. I'm just trying to get through right now. So one might say, well, this having spirit eyes is all well and good. But you don't know the pain I have. You don't understand the depression that I cannot climb out of, that knocks me down. You don't understand the constant suffering that I go through. How do you respond to that? Here's how Paul responds. In every way, we show we are servants of God 
in accepting many hard things, in troubles, in difficulties, in great problems, we are beaten, thrown into prison. We meet those who become upset with us and start riots. We work hard, and sometimes we get no sleep or food. We show we are servants of God by our pure lives, our understanding, our patience, and kindness. By the Holy Spirit, By true love. By speaking the truth and by God's power. We use our right living to defend ourselves against everything. Some people honor us and others blame us. Some people say evil things about us. Others say good things. Some people say we're liars. But we speak the truth. We are not known. It wasn't that famous person. But we are well known. We seem to be dying. Nothing like being stoned and being left for dead to make you feel like you're dying. But we continue to live. We are punished, but we are not killed. We have much sadness, but we are always rejoicing. We are poor, but we are making many people rich in faith. We have nothing, but really, we have everything. Recall his list in 2 Corinthians 11 of all the things that he had been through. Stonings, beatings with rods. I was thinking this morning about here are these young men who are going to be evangelist preachers. They're sitting around having breakfast. So who did the elders assign you to? Well, I get to go with Andrew. Oh, well, good. That's probably, uh, you'll probably get to stay fairly close to home. How about you? Oh, I got to go, uh, I get to go with Barnabas. That's great. He's a great teacher. Very patient man. How about you? I'm going with Paul. Oh, man, you better get ready to get whipped up on because you're going to have all kinds of trouble. That man is a walking time bomb. Acts 16. We have one of the more detailed accounts of some of the things that he went through. It's, it's easy to talk about getting beaten. It's easy to talk about these things and not make them real. Paul and Silas are in Philippi. Philippi. They have gone down to the riverside. They've met Lydia. They have talked with her. One time while they were there, they were going to a place of prayer. I am in Acts 16. 16. And a servant girl met them. Scripture says she had a special spirit. I don't know what that means, aside from the fact that that we are told she could foretell the future. She earned a lot of money for her owners. She was a slave girl. She earned a lot of money by telling fortunes. And she started following Paul and us. It would have been Silas and whoever else was with Paul, maybe other believers. And, and she was shouting. Paul couldn't go anywhere. Couldn't go to the market. Couldn't. She's following it. These men are servants of the Most High God. They're telling you how you can be saved. Kind of takes the mystique out of what's going to happen, doesn't it? This Paul's going to approach you. Well, she kept this up for many days. And this bothered Paul so much. I mean, how do you go up and talk to somebody when there's this gal standing behind you yelling? So he turned and said to the spirit, by the power of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. Immediately the spirit came out. When the owners of the girls saw this, they realized, oh, there goes our prophets. I don't know how, if, if there was something that occurred, if all of a sudden she had a change in appearance or demeanor, but they knew that now they could not use her to make money. They grabbed Paul and They're in the marketplace. They grabbed Paul and Silas, they dragged them before the city rulers here in the marketplace, 
And they brought Paul and Silas to the Roman rulers, still in the marketplace, and said, These men are Jews and are making trouble in our city. They're teaching things that are not right for us as Romans to do. The crowd joined the attack against them. The Roman officers tore the clothes of Paul and Silas. But don't take your best suit, by the way, because Paul, people that are with him, a lot of times their clothes get ripped off. Don't, don't take your best suit. The Roman officers tore the clothes of Paul and Silas and had them beaten with rods. Then Paul and Silas were thrown into jail, and the jailer was ordered to guard them carefully. When he heard this order, he put them far inside the jail and pinned their feet down between large blocks and put them in footstocks. This kind of thing still happens in some Asian countries. We have read of people getting publicly, they call it caning, because even though in the scripture it's called rods, it was probably um, sticks that were as, at least as big around as your finger, if not bigger. And these were used to beat people. Sometimes they were used, they would hang people upside down and beat their feet until they broke all the bones in their feet so that people couldn't walk. Other times it was just, you just whack them in the side of the face and the head and the body, all, all over. We know that they were, they were wounded because later on in the story, the jailer who comes to his senses and realizes that he needs to be saved, the jailer washes their wounds. So we know there were wounds. But I want you to get this picture because this was not a place where Paul and Silas are sitting there, the jailer comes around, are you guys, you guys comfortable? You need, you need some, you need some more Coke or Pepsi? Uh, uh, you need to get out of stocks to go to the bathroom? No. They're sitting there, if they need to use the restroom, too bad. They are in pain. They have been beaten. They haven't eaten. They haven't drunk. You guys want some water? No. So when we talk about Paul and his sufferings and his list of things that he had to go through, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to minimize anyone's current day sufferings, anyone's current day trials or tribulations. I'm just trying to get us to have perspective. Have us keep the right perspective about anything, anything that we encounter here compared to what is to come. It is nothing. Nothing. If we could ask any of the faithful who have gone ahead, if we could somehow talk to Steve Turnbull or John Rice or right now talk with Dolly Carter, you think they would say anything differently from what Paul is saying? Would they, would they say, eh, mm, mm. no, it's worth it. But we still have to deal with it. On a day-to-day -day basis, don't we? Having the faith of Abraham and looking for a country whose builder and maker is God doesn't take away my mental anguish, my physical pain, those sleepless nights endured because there's no position of comfort, my emotional suffering, or my loneliness. And that, I think, is why Paul writes those first verses in chapter 5. This passage, this 416 through 58. Those are some of my favorite verses because in emergency medicine, I dealt with a lot of people who were in pain. I dealt with a lot of people who were suffering. And when there was nothing I could do for them, I could share these passages with them. We know that our body, the tent we live in here on earth, will be destroyed. 
And when that happens, God will have a house for us. It will not be a house made by human hands. Instead, it will be a home in heaven that will last forever. But now, we groan in this tent. We want God to give us our heavenly home because it will clothe us so we will not be naked. While we live in this body, we have burdens and we groan. We do not want to be naked, but we want to be clothed with our heavenly body, our heavenly home. Then this body that dies will be fully covered with life. This is what God made us for. And he has given us the spirit to be a guarantee of this new life. I know there are those out there. I have, I'm very fortunate. I have had good health nearly all my life. And I know about this because I live with someone who doesn't. And I know there are those who think these words daily or live with someone who frequently declares, I just want to die. I can't stand this anymore. When one has health, and a relatively pain-free existence. It is difficult to relate to someone who frequently breaks down in tears because they are so absolutely miserable every waking hour. This body is being and will be destroyed. It is falling apart. I know that's difficult for some of the young folks to appreciate because when you're 19, 20, you're going to live forever. Uh, there's a country and western song, everybody wants to be 21. The body's falling apart. When I was a child, I remember listening on the radio to a song that was popular. I think Pat Boone was singing it in those days. Uh, it's been sung by Stuart Hamblin uh, in recent years, more recently at least. I believe the Statler Brothers recorded it. Excuse me. Basically, the song is an allegory of a house that is falling down. But it's really about the deterioration of one's body and the anticipation of getting the new house. The new house not made with hands that will last forever. By the way, this song is not an exercise in proper grammar. Ain't you going to need this house no longer? Ain't you going to need this house no more? Ain't got time to fix the shingles, ain't got time to fix the floor, ain't got time to all the hinges or to mend the window pane. Ain't you gonna need this house no longer, I'm a getting ready to meet the saints. Well, this old house once knew my children, this old house once knew my wife. This old house was home and comfort as we fought the storms of life. This old house once rang with laughter, this old house heard many shouts. Now she trembles in the darkness when the lightning walks about. Ain't gonna need this house no longer. Ain't gonna need this house no more. Ain't got time to fix the shingles. Ain't got time to fix the floor. Ain't got time to oil the hinges nor to mend the window pane. Ain't gonna need this house no longer. I'm a getting ready to meet the saints. We'd love to be rid of this body. Some more than others. But we don't want to be without a body, do we? Just existing out there, suspended, being, being a being, but not a being. No, we want that new body that we will have on the resurrection day. A body that will cover us with life forever. No pain, no suffering, no tears. No worries, no sleepless nights, no fatigue, no exhaustion, 
No wrinkles. No aging. No bruises. No broken bones. And this is what God made us for. And he has given us the spirit to be a guarantee for this new life. God didn't form our bodies of the dust of the ground to stay like this. When in Genesis 2-7 it says he formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, that life was destined for a heavenly body, not that body he had just created out of dirt. He created our lives to ultimately live in bodies eternal. And the spirit we receive at baptism guarantees that as long as we live in the spirit, as long as we walk in the light, as long as we walk with Christ, we will get that new life. That, Paul declares, is the reason that he keeps going through all of his personal pain and suffering and all the troubles he deals with. Was it fun being stoned? Do you think that he didn't have chronic pain problems being beat three times with rods, being whipped multiple times, being stoned? You see, the idea of stoning was to kill someone. Paul says we always have courage. We know that while we live in this body, we are away from the Lord. We live by what we believe, not by what we can see. So I say that we have courage. We really want to be away from this body and be at home with the Lord. Our only goal is to please God, whether we live here or there, because we all must stand before God. Christ to be judged. Each of us will receive what we should get, good or bad, for the things we did in our earthly body. Have you ever heard anyone so miserable in life, in this life, who cries, I'd be better off dead? Of course. That is the case. If one has put on the life that Christ gives, for example, John 14, 6, Romans 6, 3, Colossians 3, 1 and 10, and others. Paul reassures us about when, when all this new life begins. Right now! Right now. This is the same conflict mentioned in many other passages between the physical, the here and now, and the spiritual, what we will ultimately become. In Galatians, after talking about the things our physical side tries to pull us into, describing what the sinful self wants, the flesh, Paul lists how having the spirit working in us produces spiritual things. And then he reveals to us when we begin getting this new body, this new us. When, when, when? On reception of the spirit. The new body, the new house, the new tent, whatever you want to call it, the new dwelling will never be completed here. But we are beginning the new life here with Christ, according to Romans. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we, all should, we also should walk in newness of life, the new person. We get our new life from the Spirit, Galatians 5, 25 says. So we should follow the Spirit. The New English even uses the new man language. In Colossians 3 says, Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man and have been clothed with the new man that is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of the one who created it. 
There's a song on that resurrection morning when all the dead in Christ shall rise. I'll have a new body, praise the Lord, I'll have a new life. It starts right now with the Holy Spirit. We're going to stop there. But this is what gave Paul hope. In spite of his chronic pain, I, you know, the scripture doesn't talk about it, but I know he had it. Anybody that had been stoned the way he had been stoned, had been beaten, had gone through the things he'd gone through, you, you're going to suffer every day of your life. You're going to have sleepless nights because you cannot get comfortable, especially on cold prison floors. Let's close with a word of prayer. And there will be a break. We'll sing some songs. And then we'll get to hear from Darren as he talks to us a little bit about the songs. And from Dan. Lord, we are so thankful of the promises that you give us. Of the glimpses that you give us into what we are going to be. And, and, and telling us how... The earth is just waiting to see what we're going to do. Help us understand it's all going to be worthwhile. It's all going to be worthwhile. Give us hope. Give us strength and encouragement, especially on those dark days when it seems there is no end to the pain. There is no end to the suffering. There is no hope for the depression. Give us hope. Give us strength. Give us the spirit of light and life. These things we pray in Christ. Amen.